welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello Walter. How are you doing today? No, I'm doing very well. And you? Thank you. I'm doing just fine. Yes. Can you open up for us with a word of prayer? Absolutely. Please? Our Heavenly Father, without you we can do nothing. And uh, you have given us so many instructions and so much wisdom in all your writings and your word. And you must help us please to delve into your word so that we might find the answers that you have hidden for us there. Give us wisdom, may your angels protect us, and may we be readied as a people for your soon coming, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today we have to look at a few questions and comments again that we've received over the past few weeks because we don't get to everything, all the questions, but we try and get to most of them. I see many of the people ask questions and then other people answer for yes. them. That, uh, that helps. That helps a lot, yes. yes. That's very nice. And thank you, by the way, for all the very nice comments. And thank you also for keeping us on our toes with the um, critical <laughs> questions and, and comments. Questions. Yes, yes. Uh, also thank you to our members. Yes. We appreciate all the people that watch WhatsApp Prof. Yes. There was a statement by one of the viewers that the oil fields that you mentioned that can rapidly form, um, he stated that uh, oil is not a, f a fossil uh, fuel from before the flood because Noah had to use pitch and to build the ark and there should have been oil before the flood. So mm -hmm. can you comment for us on that? Well, it is known that oil can form quite rapidly mm. if organic material is uh, in a certain condition and uh, there have been reports of rapid oil formation and uh, that is something that occurred before the flood already. As soon as sin came into the world, death came into the world. So decay became part of the equation when the world entered this new phase. Animals were changed, diets were changed, decay became a common factor in the environment. And so because the pre-flood world was so rich in, in vegetation and organic material, when decay takes place in those situations, then you would have pitch formation even before the flood. Mm. Of course, when you totally destroy the world and bury all this vast amount of organic material, decayed and alive, then you will get oil formation. So in a sense, oil is a fossil fuel, but it also formed to a lesser extent, but it did form before the flood. Yes. So pitch would have been available, absolutely. Yeah, because there was also a lot of time since Adam and the decay came in till Noah. Absolutely. There's a lot of questions about the king of the north and south since we've started it three episodes ago. And we are going to be dealing with it in an upcoming WhatsApp Prof. Yes, we are going to do another structured little follow-up series like the last one. And I think a lot of the questions that people have will be addressed in that one because we didn't actually do the Bible studies. No. We just mentioned it. What is the king of the north? What is the king of the south? We mentioned a few verses in the book of Daniel. But we didn't go into the details. The details you find actually in Revelation chapter 11. Yes. And we didn't go into that. So we will be dealing with the king of the north and the king of the south in the next episode or the next episodes, and we will talk about what their attributes are. Okay. Perhaps just briefly, uh, the secular mindset, where God is separated from the equation, that's King of the South philosophy. That doesn't mean they don't have a religion. Egypt was an idolatrous nation. They had many gods. 
But in a modern sense, we have many gods too. We're also an idolatrous nation. Your television can be an idol. Sports can be an idol. Anything that you do to excess is an idol. Mm. So there are many, many idols which take you away from the Word of God and uh, the mindset of the King of the South is not against idolatry, but against bringing the specific truth into the equation. And the King of the North, he is the King of Babylon. Hmm. And the religion of Babylon was Baal worship, and it was mother and child worship for that matter. And the king of the north, just like the king of the south, was a god king. Pharaoh was a god king. And so the king of the north is also a god king. But to him, it is essential that you bow down to his deity. Force. You have to do that. Yes, he forces you. He forces you to follow his worship plan and if you don't it's his way or the highway <laughs> and there's a difference between the two mindsets but we'll deal with that in a subsequent one i see there's also a question who is moab the moabites came about because of the unfortunate circumstances surrounding the story of lot yes. remember his daughters conceived by him under very unfortunate circumstances and Moab was one of the descendants of that union. Yes. Now the Moabites were therefore basically part of the family of, of Abraham. Yes. And the Ammonites the same thing. So if you want to put that in a modern um, setup, you could say that in a modern setup, the Moabites would be those that would be related to those that had the truth, but were slightly off color in certain areas or had different views in certain areas which were not necessarily biblical. So that's where that comes in. There's also lots of questions on Alan White that endorsed the book Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. And now they want to know if she endorses the book didn't she know about the, um, him mentioning the Turks being the king of the north? There was a lot of debate about the king of the north and the king of the south amongst the pioneers. And uh, Uriah Smith did a wonderful work in writing this book and showing what the, the thought pattern was. And his position was, of course, that the king of the north uh, represented the Turks. But others, again, on the basis of Bible study, said, no, this is, this is inconsistent with the Bible. And James White was one of them, and he said, no, the king of the north must be the papacy, because the king of the north is the one that subjected uh, the children of Israel to his religion. And he sent them to his universities to educate them in that religion. And he changed their names to represent his religion. In other words, he wanted to incorporate them into his religious system. Now, who does that in, in the world today? Obviously, that is the papacy. So there were those that thought that it was the papacy. Now, James White went onto the stage and actually defended the position that the king of the north was the papacy and not the Turks. And he did it in a sharp fashion, using his evidence. Mm. And he got rebuked. Yes, That's the next question. Why did Alan White rebuke? He got rebuked not for what he said. He got rebuked for the way in which he said it. He should have gone to his brother and said, listen, what you are saying is not biblically correct. Let's think about it. Let's work on this together. Let's see if we can find the solution from the Bible. And then if he didn't listen to that, then the discussion would have been different. But he never did that. He went straight out and he attacked the man instead of attacking the issue.
And they, that's why Ellen White then... Yes, there's no doubt that James White was theologically correct on the issue. Now, the book in general that was written, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, had so many good features in it. There was this one point of controversy, but uh, she endorsed the book, yes. But that thought was brought out very clearly and rectified. So there shouldn't be a problem to just make that correction in your mind when you read the book. So I don't see a problem with it at all. Okay, and like you said, it will become clearer in the uh, next episode. Uh, absolutely, we will be talking about it in the next episode. Okay, there were also questions after some of our previous episodes about where the line should be drawn as to our involvement in politics, right? Yes. And what about voting? Uh, some people felt that it was a civil duty to be involved in, mm. in these things. So where should we draw the line? Perhaps we can take a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy to see if we can find some clarity over there. So this is Councils for the Church, page 315. The Lord would have his people bury political questions. On these themes, silence is eloquence. Christ calls upon his followers to come into unity on the pure gospel principles which are plainly revealed in the word of God. We cannot with safety vote for political parties. For we do not know whom we are voting for. We cannot with safety take part in any political scheme. She does say in other places that you can become involved in a local sphere but when it comes to those who have uh, more temperate views and views on temperance as opposed to those who don't because that's dealing with your local sphere. But when it comes to the political scheme, which side do you choose? Which side do you choose uh, in the debate, for example, in the United States at the moment? There are many issues on both sides that you might agree with, and there are many issues on both sides that you would not agree with. There are many issues on both sides which might sound biblical and there are many issues on both sides which definitely don't sound biblical. When you become a citizen of the kingdom of God, then you become a representative. You become a representative of God's kingdom to all, to all peoples, nations, tribes and tongues. Now, an ambassador does he get to vote in your country? No. Let's say the French ambassador in South Africa, does he get to vote in, when it comes to voting? No. Why not? Because he's not... He's not a South African. He's, he's representing France, for yes. example, if he's the French ambassador or the German ambassador or whoever. Mm. Now, if you become a citizen of God and you come out and you are separate, who do you represent? God. You represent God. So those who are Christians indeed will be branches of the true vine and will bear the same fruit as the vine. Your mind changes. They will act in harmony in Christian fellowship. They will not wear political badges but the badge of Christ. Now, can I be contentious? Sometimes we are contentious, right? We spoke about Black Lives Matter. That was quite a contentious issue. And uh, uh, it's an issue that can make one very hot under the collar. But let's say that in our country, for example, let's say you were a staunch supporter of the previous regime. And then you became a Christian and certain issues of the previous regime no longer gelled with what you now believed, does that automatically make you a follower of the subsequent regime? Or let's put it pertinently, if one regime, let's say, is an apartheid regime, and the next regime, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying if it should be a Marxist regime, 
would you then, because you agree, disagree with aspects of one regime, switch over to the other regime? What if those are the only two options? How would you get involved? Mm. Yes. Or would you preach the kingdom of God? It's just a question. They will act in harmony in Christian fellowship. They will not wear political badges, but the badge of Christ. What are we to do then? Let political questions alone. There is a large vineyard to be cultivated, but while Christians are to work amongst unbelievers, they are not to appear like worldlings. They are not to spend their time talking politics or acting politics, for by do so doing they give the enemy opportunity to come in and cause variance and discord. Now this doesn't mean that you cannot discuss the impact of a political system on prophecy. Mm. Because the Bible tells us we must study history. We must study the workings of God amongst the nations. We must understand these things in a prophetic context. But as we have constantly stated in this program, we are observers. Yes. Observers. God's children are to separate themselves from politics, from any alliance with unbelievers. Do not take part in political strife. Separate from the world and refrain from bringing into the church or school ideas which will lead to contention and disorder. Dissension is the moral poison taken into the system by human beings who are selfish. And that is the position that we should have. Now, one can certainly support certain ideas, but to link it to a package is a very dangerous thing to do. Yes. Another question we had was, can you please explain what the difference is between imputed and imparted justification? Okay, there's a slight misunderstanding in this question because if we had said, can you please explain what's the difference between an imputed and imparted righteousness, then uh, it would be easier to deal with because justification is a judicial act. So what is imputed righteousness and what is imparted righteousness? Now we know that we have no righteousness of our own. All our righteousness, says the Bible, is filthy rags. So the only claim we have to righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. Now imputed righteousness is an alien righteousness which is imputed to you, reckoned towards you, as though it were yours. So Martin Luther called it an alien righteousness. It is a righteousness outside of yourself. It is Christ's righteousness which is accredited to you even though you are undeserving. So it is a gift from God yes. and it's a judicial act. It is saying this person is reckoned righteous because of my imputed righteousness. So it is a statement and it is a judicial statement and it comes into effect the moment you accept that you are a sinner, that you repent of your sins and that you lay claim to the promise of Christ that he is your redeemer and he is your righteousness. Then that judicial act comes into play. Imparted righteousness is the change that takes place within you as Christ works in you. So we can say that imputed righteousness is justification. Okay. Imparted righteousness is sanctification. It is a process. Yes. It's not something that happens in, in a moment. But it changes you. It can change you to the point where your mother doesn't recognize you yeah. <laughs> anymore. <laughs> If you were a drunkard, you are no longer a drunkard. If you were a thief, you are no longer a thief. If you were a liar, you are no longer a liar. 
because that voice and that power working in you, again, it is not you who's now becoming the bee's knees, it is Christ in you that is affecting the change. So both imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness are gifts from, from God. God. Imputed righteousness is justification. Imparted righteousness is sanctification. sanctification. And that's, that's how Thank one you. should explain it. That's why you cannot say imputed and imparted justification, um, because justification implies, applies to the imputed part, but not to the imparted part. Thank you. Pleasure. Was Lucifer and his angels cast out before or after the fall of man? Well, he was cast out before the fall of man. There was war in heaven. Mm. When Adam and Eve were deceived by the serpent, he was already down here on earth. He still had access to heaven. Mm. How do we know that? Job. Because in the book of Job, it tells us that there was a council in heaven yes. and the representatives of the created worlds came and presented themselves before God. And the Lord asked Satan, where are you from? No. And he says, I come from walking to and fro upon the earth. Now that statement implies ownership. Mm. If you walk to and fro, that means you have ownership. Today, there are little signs everywhere which say trespassers will be prosecuted. Now, does the owner of the land concern himself with a little sign? No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> he doesn't care to hoots about exactly. the sign because he's the owner. Yeah. So, Christ was the original creator and owner of everything. Yes. And then he gave dominion to Adam and Eve. Mm. And Satan stole the dominion yes. from them. And he became the representative. Yes. Now, how long did that continue? Until the cross. Yeah. Because there, Christ paid the price. And Satan was vanquished. And he lost his position. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. His access to heaven. Yes. But he and his angel had been thrown out after the rebellion. And the solution that God had to the rebellion was the creation of man. Yeah. Thank you. So, let's see what else we have got. Ah, the sign of Jonah. Yes. Now, I think what the people are talking about here is the issue of three days and three nights. For yes. as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so there are many that say there wasn't a Friday crucifixion. It was a Wednesday crucifixion. Yes. And uh, there were church denominations that preached that. But the general Christian world has always accepted the Friday to Sunday issue. Now, how do we get the answer to this one? We have to understand the historic context. We have to understand the, the mode of reckoning time in the Jewish economy. They used inclusive reckoning. Any portion of a day was considered a day. So whether it was an hour or whether it was the full 24 hours, it was a day. Now originally in the Bible, it defined a day as, and it was evening and it was morning the first day. And it was evening and it was morning the second day. And later on it tells us in the Bible, from evening to evening shall your Sabbaths be. So a day starts when the sun sets the and the day ends at the next sunset. It's actually a beautiful system. So when would it be day one? Any portion of the first day-night period. Mm. And so we talk about days or we talk about evenings and mornings 
as a designation of the day. If you look, go to Daniel, the 2300 day prophecy, it's evening and morning, right? And it was evening and it was morning the first day. That designates a day. So it wouldn't be wrong to translate it 2300 days yes. in that case, for example. Okay, so that was the way in which they worked. They used inclusive reckoning. They took it further. Any portion of a year was considered the first year. Yeah. So you wouldn't say, okay, now it is September and your year will end in September. So if you came in in December and you were still part of the system, that was year one. Mm. That's why you get the anomaly that Nebuchadnezzar was in his second year and Daniel already in his third year, although Nebuchadnezzar was the one who'd actually uh, taken Daniel yes. to, to Babylon, right? It's the, the reckoning. The, the one reckoning is Hebrew was different. reckoning, that one is Babylonian. Correct. Reckoning. And the Babylonians had what they called an ascension year, which was not reckoned. Okay. So the Bible is absolutely spot on it is humanity that gets mixed up and muddled up when it comes to these issues. So when was Christ crucified? We have to find the answer in the Bible. Yes. And I always like to, and by the way, I, I did a whole Bible study on that, and I think it's on the Amazing Discoveries webpage. Yes, I'll put a link I, to it. I think it's in Bible Answers. answers yes. Yeah. So if we go to the Gospel, I'd like to take the Gospel of Mark. Because uh, it shows it very nicely and very clearly. And we can start there with chapter 11. Now, I, I like this story. Because the Gospel of Mark from chapter 11 describes the last week mm -hmm. in Jesus' life. From the triumphant entry. Now, Jesus had spent the Sabbath with Lazarus and his family. Remember he had resurrected Lazarus and he had spent the Sabbath there. And on the first day of the week they entered into Jerusalem and Lazarus was the one leading the ass, the foal of a donkey, right? Yeah. And this was an amazing scene. And then it describes to us the various situations that happened and what happened and the stories and what Jesus taught and everything is in there but it is sequential mm -hmm. now it doesn't mention which day it was but you by working back and find out exactly that it was the first day of the week it was Sunday mm -hmm. when the triumphant entry took place so Jesus had spent the Sabbath with Lazarus and his family it's a, it's a beautiful story because uh, he actually went to have lunch, Sabbath lunch, with uh, uh, Simon. And Simon used, was a leper. Yes. And Jesus had healed him from his leprosy and he should have been very grateful, right? And Mary Magdalene was also there and she brought this beautiful ointment, this wonderfully expensive perfume and she anointed Jesus' head for his burial as he claimed yes. and she washed his feet with her tears and Simon was giving him <laughs> the look <laughs> and saying oh, I, know, I know he was thinking this man healed me from my leprosy but does he know what manner of woman this is? Because obviously he knew, right? And then Jesus told him that uh, if you were forgiven much, you loved much. And he told the little parable about the one who had been forgiven much and the one who had not been forgiven much. And that all took place on the Sabbath day. Now comes the triumphant entry. He's already been anointed for his death. Yes. Now I find it very interesting that this week that is described here, to me, is the antithesis to the creation week. Okay. So the creation week was six days, one day rest. Yes. Right? And here you have six days of labor mm. 
and a rest in the grave. Yes. Now, if we look at it in that way, let's see if we can find something interesting. Uh, and when they came nigh unto Jerusalem, unto Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and says unto them, Go your way into the village over and against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, one, tied whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him, and if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Say that the Lord has need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And then it tells the story of the triumphant entry. That's day one. Yes. Doesn't mention the day, doesn't mm -hmm. say anything about it, it just tells us that's day the day one. one. And if you drop down to verse 12, now my Bible is the normal King James Bible, and I've mentioned this before, but if I can show you over here. Yes. You see verse 12 is written in bold face. Now I like a Bible that has new paragraphs indicated by bold face like this one because then the thoughts don't run into each other. For example, verse 11 is not bold face, neither are any of those, so that's all one paragraph. And here the next paragraph starts and it says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and that was the new day, so that was day two, and you carry on, verse 13 and 14 are not bold face. Then verse 15 is a new paragraph, it's written in bold face. And it goes down, and you come to verse 20, it's bold face, and it says, In the morning, as they passed by, new paragraph, so this is a new thought, this is a new day, this is day three. So it's useful to have that, because it tells you close this of one little story, beginning of next little story. Then verse 12 says, and on the morning, so that's the next day. Second day, yeah. So you don't know what day it is, doesn't say that. Now we know it was Sunday, because the Sabbath he had been uh, Resting. with Lazarus, mm. but now he was the triumphant entrant, and Lazarus was leading mm. uh, the fall. And on the morrow when they had come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off, so here is this, this very mournful story of the fig tree. Now, I don't want to give a whole Bible study no, no, on this, that's but a whole Bible it's, lecture it's, on its, own. it's almost irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> figs are amazing because figs actually start making their fruits before the leaves come. Mm. So if there are lots of leaves, you would expect what? Lots of fruits. All right. Now, it was not the season for figs. Mm. So here was a fig tree. It was full of leaves, so it should have had figs. And the others had no leaves. So you wouldn't expect figs on them yet. Yes. Okay, so he gets there and he curses the fig tree because it had no fruit. It was a presumptuous fig tree. Mm. <laughs> now, what is interesting to me in that parable, uh, one of my family members was very enraged by this parable because it seemed so unreasonable that Jesus should have done this. But uh, I don't think she understood the meaning of this parable. In this, in this story, it's not a parable, it's an, an acted parable, yeah. if you like. The fig tree represented, of course, Israel. Mm. And it had leaves, so it was presumptuously pretentious, but it had no fruit. Yes. The others were not presumptuous, they had no, no leaves, so you couldn't expect fruit, right? And they, of course, represented the Gentile nations yes. that didn't have fruit so and they didn't have leaves. Yeah. They weren't pretending to know the yeah. truth and be representatives whatsoever. And he cursed the fig tree because Israel was of course the one that rejected the truth. So that was day two. And then it, this is the last week of Jesus' life. So if he was crucified on the Wednesday, then we should find it in here, right? Correct. Okay, then we drop down to verse 20. And there it says, and in the morning. Yeah. So that is the third day now. 
And then it tells you everything that happened and what Jesus taught. And uh, a long story about everything that Jesus taught on that specific day. And it goes through quite a number of chapters in the Bible. And then, so if that was the third day, and let's, let's for the sake of argument assume that we are dealing with from Sunday. So then we had Sunday, Monday, Tuesday gone. And then chapter 14, it tells us, after two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened breed. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft. So let's read that again in two days. So we are now here on the fourth day now. And it tells us what's happening on the fourth day and that Judas went out to betray the Lord with the Pharisees. He made a deal with them. He actually wanted Jesus to show his power. Yes. He wanted to force his hand, as it were. And then if we drop down to verse 12, you will again see that it is bold type. Yes. And it says, And the first day of unleavened bread, so first it was the second one, now it's the fourth day. So this is the fifth day. And what happened then? They killed the Passover. So what day was that? That was the Thursday. Yes. His disciples said to him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou might eat us the Passover? Now, they ate the Passover at sunset, right? Yes. So once the sunset was over, what day were you in then? The sixth day. Then you were in the sixth day. So on the fifth day, they're preparing for the Lord's Supper and everything that happened on the Lord's Supper. And that was the fifth day. Now when the sun had set, then it was the sixth, the day. sixth day. So and this it, is the Thursday afternoon in the evening is the beginning of the sixth day. Correct. So on that night, Thursday evening, when it became Friday, that evening was Friday, the sixth day, Jesus went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And everything that happened there in the garden, uh, I'll be doing a sermon next on what the issue was and how it relates to our time, what is important. Uh, that'll be the next sermon that we'll be doing on amazing discoveries. And so that Friday, the night after the Thursday had closed after sunset, Jesus was arrested and Jesus was tried through the night and they had the night trial. But they weren't allowed to pass judgment if it was not day. It was one of their rules. So I just want to make it clear, that if I understand it now. So we're talking about the sixth day. This is the Thursday evening in our reckoning up yeah. until the Friday. So during the night they were busy with the trials yes. of Jesus and straightway in the morning, that's chapter 15. So this is now Friday morning. Mm. Yes. The chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away. So here was the morning trial, because now it was legal. It was very early in the morning. The sun had just risen, and off they went to Pilate. And then it tells you everything that happened uh, on that particular day. And then, on that Friday, they crucified him. On that same day. Yes. But now it's interesting that the Bible actually gives us the hours. Yes. Gives us the hours of this particular day. And they told you what happened to him and how they took him to Herod and how he was taken to the place of the skull. And then it says in verse 24, And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour... And they crucified him. Now, when was the third hour? 
Now, when they started reckoning, mm. not when does the day start and no. when does the day end, but, but when does the morning the start? Hours, they started counting hours at six o'clock in the morning. Yes. So, so from six o'clock, the third hour would be nine o'clock. Yeah. So by nine o'clock on that morning, they had already procured all of these issues and he was on the cross. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And then we drop down to verse 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Mm. So it gives us the hours. Perfect. So there was darkness from the sixth hour, which was 12, 12 o'clock noon, until the ninth hour, which was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So we're all still on this one day. Okay, yes. And at the ninth hour, that's three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this is when he died. So we know that it was before the Sabbath. Now mm -hmm. let's just make sure. In verse 42, it spells it out. Now when the evening was come, so it was going into the late afternoon evening stage, right? Yes. It was still the Friday. Still Friday. He died at 3 o'clock. It says because it was the preparation. Okay. That is the day before the Sabbath. You can't go wrong mm -hmm. there. Now this word, the preparation, mm -hmm. was used specifically for the preparation for the seventh day Sabbath. Correct. Because there's some people that say that was the preparation for the yearly Sabbath. For the ceremonial yes. Sabbath. But this makes it quite clear that it was a high Sabbath. It was a yearly Sabbath which happened to coincide with a weekly, weekly Sabbath, Sabbath, which made it a high, high Sabbath. Sabbath. And if you consider this the last week of Jesus' life, mm -hmm. it is actually the week of recreation. To recreate humanity into the image of God through what we just discussed, the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ. Yes. So this last week, which started off with a triumphant entry, the first time when he allowed himself to be acknowledged as the Messiah. Yes. Amazing, right? Yes. And Actually the acknowledged also like the Messiah and the King. And the King. Yes. He was Messiah, he was King, he was the one, and they shouted, here's the one that comes riding on a donkey. Yes. They knew the prophecy. Yes. And here he comes, and this is the cre recreation week. It is as important a week as, as the creation week. In fact, it's more important yeah. because it reveals the entire character of God. So beautiful, it was the preparation. That is the day before the Sabbath. And then they laid him in the grave, right? And they anointed him as far as they could, but then they had to stop. Yes. Because why? The Sabbath was coming. So it says in verse 16, in chapter 16, verse 1, And when the Sabbath was passed, so we know that the Sabbath is when he was in the grave, because it says previously in verse 46, yeah. And he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulchre, which was hewn out of a rock, and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulchre. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. So there he laid for the Sabbath day. That's the seventh day. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week. Explicit. Okay, so let's work it back. Mm -hmm. 
the first day of the week, we know, it's Sunday. a Sunday. The Sabbath, he was in the grave. Yes. The Friday, we have the hours so that we know what took place from sunset Thursday to sunset, sunset. Friday. So three o'clock he had died, enough time for him to go into the grave. In fact, Pilate was surprised that he had died. Yes. Because they had to break the legs of the others uh, to hasten the process. Yes. Because they had to get him off before the Sabbath. Correct, according to their rules, right? So this whole issue is very clear. From the triumphant entry, you had day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, giving you the hours. Mm -hmm. Then it had the Sabbath, laying in the grave, rest. So it follows the creation week. Yes. Six days shalt thou labor, but the Sabbath is rest. He rested in the grave and he rose to the continue his work as high priest on the first day of the week. The creator. Correct. In the first week of creation, the creator, the same creator that made the first week, rested in the grave the second week. How far? According to their custom, not according to the Bible, were they allowed to walk on a Sabbath day? They weren't allowed to walk more than a kilometer, right? So they had all kinds of interesting plans as to how to walk further. Yes. So they used to hide food under a stone and said, well, there where you eat, that's your home. So now you can walk the next one. So Didn't you also mention sometime that they had in their coats uh, woven in and then they take it off and put it down and then they can walk another? Correct. You know. Now, uh, that Sunday morning, mm. There were two gentlemen that walked all the way to Emmaus. Remember that? Correct. And what did Jesus do? He appeared to them. And he walked he with them. He gave them a Bible study. He gave them a Bible study. So it was a working day for him. And he walked many kilometers on that day. So the Bible is very clear. There was no Wednesday crucifixion because then this whole gospel would be null and void. It's beautiful how this whole creation week and crucifixion week come into harmony and also with the whole plan of salvation. Absolutely. So you had the six days and the day of rest. And the six days and the day of rest. Yes. Will there be future prophets with prophetic light? Well... Joel said in chapter 2, verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So this is a prophecy that under the latter reign there would be manifestations. Now prophecy has two meanings. One could be visions, and the other one could be preaching. preaching the truth. Both are used interchangeably. Now, how many prophets were normally called at a time? Not many, right? No. So, we believe that the prophetic gift was given to Ellen G. White, but mm. that doesn't mean that others didn't also receive it. Uh, we had William Foy, for example, who had visions. And Hazen Foss had visions, but they refused to speak on these issues. And it doesn't mean that this prophetic gift is a one-time issue. People will have dreams, and people will have meaningful dreams, but that should be not be the norm whereupon to base your religion. A manifestation is not the best proof for a reality. Mm. The best proof always lies in the Word yeah. of God. So yes, I believe that people will have dreams. Yes, I believe that dreams can be very meaningful. And yes, I believe that in the end time, God will lead many to righteousness through dreams, but that doesn't make them prophets. Mm -hmm. It's something for them personally, just for interest's sake. We were speaking about Emmaus. 
Now, when Jesus appeared to them, he could have come there in shining glory. And they would have fallen on their faces and they would have rejoiced and they would have worshipped him and they would have known that this is the Jesus Christ whom they had served and he has been resurrected. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Mm -hmm. Did he do it that way? No. No. He concealed his glory. He concealed his divinity. They recognized him not. Mm -hmm. They saw him as a fellow traveler who had a better insight of the prophecies than they had. So then Jesus goes and he expounds to them from what? From the scriptures. Uh Aha. Everything concerning himself. He gives them a Bible study. Interesting also, it's the Old Testament. Well, there was no New (laughs) Testament. So he gave them a Bible study. And what did they say? Our hearts burned inside of us. Isn't that correct? And then at the meal. Yeah, I just want to add, they ran back. The, or the rest of the way. That's correct, when they recognized it. <laughs> but burning. when did they recognize it? Mm. They ran back after he had blessed the bread and they recognized him. And then for the first time, they probably saw the marks in his hands mm. and their eyes were opened and they recognized who he was. And they must have stormed him and he was gone. Why did he do that? Because they were the ones who were witnesses. And they shouldn't have come and said, we saw this great manifestation. We saw Jesus and he spoke to us. Mm -hmm. And he's alive, he's alive. No, they were to give Bible studies. So this is how it will work in the end as well. Yes, people will have dreams. Uh, Personally, I don't think that we will have a new prophet in the sense of Daniel or Jeremiah at the end of time. I believe many people will be led to discover the truth by even miraculous means. But the word will be the basis. And through the writings of Ellen G. White, which is basically a telescope which magnifies this word. The word is the basis and the writings of Ellen G. White are merely a telescope. They are not the word. They are the telescope to magnify the word. Everything has been told that we need for the time that we are living in and the time that we are approaching. And therefore, I personally don't believe that there will be another prophet like that. But if there should be mm-hmm. one, yes, then that prophet should be tested according to the biblical criteria. Correct. Now, I gave a lecture once on God's guiding gift. Yes. Perhaps you can put that link on because all the criteria are in there and we can see whether uh, you know they, they actually apply. And if they apply, then those same criteria. It's not enough that someone gets up and makes some biblical noises and then all of a sudden you think that that person is a prophet. Because you have to be careful. They could be false prophets. There were even those people like that in Ellen White's day. Exactly. That even went to live with her. There's a whole story that they can read and that. But if you qualify the prophet or the person saying that he's got a message from God and all this and he's a prophet according to the Bible that's your standard absolutely and then (laughs) we get we get this question a lot yes is the earth round or is it flat now I don't think we're going to answer that question we can we can answer it with a statement right yes so let's look at the statement This is a letter that was written in 1887. It's from the Spirit of Prophecy. And she was writing to a brother who was for the flat earth. And uh, 
he had some ideas and he was very strong in terms of these ideas and he felt that this should be made a central part of the teaching. Yes. And so she said, my brother, our work is to teach the third angel's message. Any kind of theory or hobby that Satan can lead the minds of men to dwell upon, he will draw their attention to, so that they shall not be engaged in giving the solemn message for this time. Do not, my brother, become entangled with the ideas that have no connection with the work for this time. It is better to be teaching the truth as it is in Jesus, better to be seeking for true godliness, heart holiness, freedom from all selfishness, freedom from all envies and jealousies. It is better to pray and humble the soul before God and let the world, round or flat, be just as God has made it. Try most earnestly by faithful continuance and well-doing to seek for a clear, clear title in the inheritance in the earth made new. Better lead the flock of God to drink at the higher streams. Better by precept and example seek God while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. There is a revival needed in the church. When the teachers are drinking fresh drafts from the well of Bethlehem, then they can lead the people to the living stream. My soul is weighed down with the burden of condition of things in New York. May the Lord raise up helpers, men whom we can teach, humble men we can lead to bear a clear, sharp testimony in faith. God help you to seek his face, to walk carefully, to put self out of sight and to exalt Jesus. This is the great need of the present time. Whether the world is round or flat will not save a soul. But whether men believe and obey means everything. Here is another statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. It comes from Manuscript 145 from 1904. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole statement. I'm going to read just the bold portion here. We have naught to do with the question whether this world is round or flat. The important thing is to serve God with full purpose of a renewed heart, sanctified and made holy by the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. But just for interest's sake, here is another one from Manuscript Releases, Volume 21, and it says, Let those who are presenting theories as to whether the earth is round or flat leave this question. For God has not given it to them to solve and earnestly inquire, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? Let them heed the answer, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. I think we can leave it there. Uh, is it wrong to study these things? Is it wrong to study any aspect of science? I don't think so. But if we make it prominent that we have a specific view in this area, you will have confrontation with those who have another view in this area, and the gospel will be lost in, in the commotion. So we at Amazing Discoveries are not going to get involved in that debate, no. which doesn't mean that we don't study it, but we won't get involved in the debate. Right, correct. And this is a question that comes up so much. What are we to do? Yes. Lots Mu of, yeah. Must we leave the city? Yes, that's the question I was just about to mention. Now, we're not going to talk about leaving the cities in this particular uh, chat that we are having. We will leave that for the next one. Yes, that's also coming in the next Episodes. The next episodes will again be dealing with the times we are living in and whether we should leave the cities and where we are uh, in, the, in the scheme of things and uh, what will happen, what will happen in particular nations. I mean, these are very, very interesting. interesting questions. Yes. But people ask, how do we grow our own vegetables? What do we do if we don't have a piece of land? Yes. What do we do under this circumstance? What do we do under that circumstance? Mm -hmm. And there again, there is no hard and fast rule. God has to 
do the leading. We shouldn't act out of impulse, but we should act as God opens the way and as he shows us clearly what our duty is in regard to these things and how we should move. She has a statement where she says, secure for yourselves land where you can grow your own vegetables because the time of buying and selling will become very acute. And people say, well, they don't have any experience in growing their own vegetables. Yes. Now, you know, you can, on a very small scale, do microculture mm. and uh, you can grow your own provisions in a house, in a house, in, a, yes. in, a, in an apartment. You don't have to have a, a vast tract of land in order to do this. So you can have um, sprouting, for example, is a way to get good fresh greens. So stock up on some good seeds. Ones that, that sprout very easily and that are very useful in terms of sprouting would of course be alfalfa. That is one that sprouts very well. So stock up on some of those seeds, get some sprouting bottles and uh, start sprouting. Look it up on the internet. That's it's what I'm saying. There's, a lot of, there's lots of videos. Oh, there's so much information out there. I mean, if you take me and my wife, we, we weren't used to this, but if you take some time, start studying it. Then it's actually fun it's and it's fun. easy to do, very yes. easy to do. And microgreens, I mean microgreens are amazing. So what would you, what would you sprout? Red seeds that sprout, start with stuff that really works every time. Alfalfa works, uh, another sprout that works would be chickpeas or lentils or mung beans, they sprout easily. Don't work with stuff that gives you great headaches. Uh, soybeans are very difficult to sprout and they will, they will discourage you. So start with the stuff that works, the simple stuff. And the same for microgreens. Microgreens are absolutely fantastic, but they, they can be done in an apartment. You don't need space for that. So microgreens, ones that, that really work well, are um, sunflower seeds. They can even use the cheap sunflower seeds that still come in their shells and you can grow the microgreens to this size and you can harvest them, cut them off with a pair of scissors and you can make, uh, put them in your stir fries, add them to your vegetables, you can eat them green while they are still small yeah. until they become too large and they're chewy. Well then you start the next batch, right? You put can have great fun. sandwich. You can put them in your sandwich and so you can get excellent food. Another one that is very good for micro, micro growing is um, flaxseed. Mm. Amazing, you wouldn't expect it, but it makes a beautiful seed. Uh, there is of course wheatgrass that you can use, but wheatgrass is something that you would have to juice. Mm. Whereas sunflower seeds and uh, another one that's very good for microgreens would be broccoli seed for sprouting. Makes a wonderful, wonderful microgreen. So you don't need anything else but that just to augment your, your minerals and yes. everything that you need. If you have a little piece of land, then you are a king and a queen. So, should we be growing our own vegetables? Well, I did give a lecture on it some time ago. We can go through some of the basic issues. If you want to do farming that, that supplies all the mineral needs that you require, then organic farming is the way to go. There are many things that you can do, uh, but organic farming is it's just it's just so much so much better yeah now some of the minerals that you need for plant growth would be nitrogen phosphorus potassium magnesium sulfur and calcium the nitrogen of course is for protein uh, phosphorus for energy transfer the potassium for carbohydrate metabolism and water relations and the magnesium you find in the chlorophyll 
molecule sulfur you need to incorporate in proteins and in, in many uh, coenzymes that work together with enzymes, calcium for the cell walls, etc., etc. Now, modern agriculture tends to concentrate on these very minerals and to supply them mm -hmm. in a soluble form. Mm -hmm. So basically they're feeding the plant. Yeah. Now in organic culture you never feed the plant, you feed the, the soil. Goals, yeah. And there's, this is the fundamental difference between the two. And those who are very steeped in feeding the plant culture, uh, they cannot get their mind often around this concept of feeding the soil. soil yeah. Now if you feed a plant with these basic minerals, you can get quite a substantial plant. But what about all the other minerals that you are missing? Because they're very important. Now some of the minerals are mobile and some are immobile. The mobile ones would be nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and magnesium. And the immobile ones would be calcium, sulfur, and the borons and the f iron and copper and manganese and uh, zinc. Now, do we have to know all of these details? And that all makes, do you have to be a biochemist in order to understand this? I think this? this is what discourages a lot of people in beginning, into, yes. into getting into it. So let's make this very simple. By the way, if you wanted to really start debating the issue, magnesium is absolutely essential for plants because chlorophyll contains magnesium, right? Mm. And uh, so people think that they must add a lot of magnesium to the ground, but if you do that, if the magnesium concentration in the ground gets too high, the bacteria die. So then you are basically feeding the plant here. Yeah. Magnesium is readily absorbed by the plant through the leaves. Mm through the stomata. So with the morning dew, there are minerals also in the morning dew and it takes it up that way. So there are many things that get, can become extremely complicated. Let's try and make it simple, simple with some basic facts. Minerals need interaction with other minerals. So if you look at interactions between minerals, you will see there are lots of minerals mentioned here, selenium, iron, calcium, and you can see all these cross reactions, how they interact with each other. So taking just five basic minerals and feeding it to the plant, which is what the modern fertilizer industry does, uh, you can get a good looking plant, but you have so many diseases and you have so much spraying to do to keep them going that it becomes unbelievable. And you actually want the plant to be able to access all of these minerals. Now where do you find these minerals? You find them in the soil. Just like minerals and vitamins also need to interact with each other. So you need a lot of minerals. Zinc is a very important one. Selenium is important. Iron is important. Copper is important. You need, you need, you need them all. all of them. And just as you have many vitamin interactions, it's not just, oh, I need this vitamin. No, this vitamin interacts with that one. That one interacts with that one. You must have a whole food scenario yes. in your mind. You must have a complete process. Now, modern agriculture tends to add soluble nutrients to the ground to feed the plant, as we have said. And organic culture works like this. Yes. This is the Natural. most productive uh, agriculture in the world. Man has not touched it. This is a tropical jungle. Yes. So this is what you would find in the Amazon, for example. And who's the gardener? God. God is the gardener. Yes. No plow has no. touched this. The most productive land in the world. Now, how does God do his gardening? There's a lot of debris and dirt on this ground, yes. right? This is a forest floor. And what have you got growing there? You've got fungi, you've mm. got trees that are decaying. Well, this one looks like it was logged, so let's just say it wasn't logged, it fell over by itself, right? And you have leaf debris and you have all of these things and no plow. Mm. And you have these massive trees. 
and they are producing so that millions of animals can survive. Now, how does God do that? Well, all of that organic material feeds the organisms in the soil. And you have microorganisms and you have macroorganisms, and they eat this organic material just like you eat organic, organic material. And in the process, they actually supply the nutrients for the plants that are growing. Now, how does that happen? So you have basically a soil web where you have all of these creatures like nematodes and arthropods and protozoans and bacteria all mixed in. And then you have some of the irritating ones like your moles oh, yeah. <laughs> that dig up your garden and birds that add yeah. nitrogen to the soil. And all of this is one harmonious interaction in one of those forests, right? Yes. All takes place. Now, the soil itself must contain all the minerals. Mm. All the minerals in the periodic table, not just five. Mm. So now, if you're coming to an area where the soil is depleted, it's not a very good soil, how do you fix it? You don't despair, you fix it. Fix it. All right, so you can, there are certain things that you can mix into your soil. Uh, soft rock phosphate is a wonderful material. Soft rock phosphate is a rock that you've changed into a powdery form and it's rich in many minerals but high in phosphorus. But it's not in a soluble form. It's locked into this rock. So when you make this rock fine, the plant cannot access it. It has to be somehow leached out of that rock, but it contains the phosphorus. Now God doesn't sprinkle fertilizer over his forests, but he has rocks in his soil that contain phosphorus. So if you come into an area and there's not enough of it, well then get hold of some soft rock phosphate if you can, in some areas it's readily available, in other areas it's not so available. Don't despair, there are other plans. Limestone, calcitic lime, is very rich in calcium, but it contains a lot of other minerals as well. A dolomitic lime contains magnesium. So if your, if your soil is incredibly magnesium poor, you might want to use dolomitic lime. Mm. But generally speaking, calcitic lime is the way to go for organic farming. Uh, calcitic lime will add all the calcium that you need and it's very cheap and you can get it at any co-op and you just get a bag and you add it to your soil. Now. If your soil is very alkaline and you want to make it more acid, you can add gypsum, which contains sulfur, sulfate, and that makes it more acid. So in a very alkaline soil, you would add gypsum. In a, a very acidic soil, you would add calcitic lime. You can add volcanic dust. Volcanic dust is amazing. It has all the minerals. Yes. So if you cannot get hold of rock phosphate, then you can add volcanic dust. Granite dust, on the other hand, is very rich in potassium, but it has all the other minerals as well, right? Yeah. So if you can add whatever combination of these that you can find in your area to your soil, it won't change anything. It won't it'll just increase. Um, it'll just make the minerals, put the minerals in the soil, but won't make them available to the plant. So that's why conventional people will say to you, that's useless. Because you're just putting it in the soil. You're putting it in the soil and the plant can't get hold of it. Mm. Okay. Now this is where the beauty of organic farming comes in. We'll discuss that in a moment. So rock fertilizers are added at double the commercial quantities. So you can add a lot to the soil. And the beauty is, that then you're done. Yeah. For the next few years, you've added it to the soil. Now you've got to make a plan to get the minerals out of that into the plant. So add green manure with your mineral fertilizer and rock powders to make them more effective. Bacteria in the soil, here's the trick. 
produce acids that make the minerals in the soil available to the plants. So you want to have bacteria in your soil. How do you get bacteria into your soil? You have to feed the soil. Yes. Now what feeds the soil? Debris. The debris, yeah. the compost, the organic material. They have to eat something, just like you have to eat something. So they have to eat organic material. So you supply the organic material. Either it's green manure, the best is compost, parts of it. And then all the other organisms, the earthworms will come into your soil and they will take it down and the bacteria will have a munching feast. Now, your stomach produces an acid to digest food, right? Protein. So the bacteria produces acid to digest the organic material. Now that acid has a two-way function. It helps digest the organic material that you've added to the soil, but it also leaches the minerals out of the rock, yeah. out of the soil. And the plant gets it. Now how does the plant get it? In a surge or continuous? Continuous. That's what you want. And that is the beauty of organic gardening. So, the most important thing in organic garden is compost. Compost is the heart of your garden. It is the food of your garden. So now, when you have cardboard and you have paper and you have uh, food waste in your house and you have uh, leaf leaves and all of these issues, they become gold. Yes. You don't throw them away. Grass so you can you use paper, you can use yard waste, you can use food waste, and all of this goes into making compost. You can, of course, just go and buy compost, mm -hmm. but if you can't buy or sell, you have to make your own, right? Mm -hmm. Now, a very good way to make compost is to have a little container like this where you throw these plant materials in and you allow them to form compost, to decay. Now, compost should be moist, but it shouldn't be wet. Mm. So you must constantly keep it moist, but not soggy. It mustn't stink, it must have this glorious earthy smell so that even a bacteria would say whew this is a grand <laughs> restaurant I love this stuff so compost is the heart and soul of organic farming composting works best in wooden bins wire bins straw bales etc you can set up any system if you have a big plot then I'll show you what you can do in a moment. Mm. So you loosen the ground where you will place your compost pile, make your compost pile two meters high with a concave top and alternate layers of soil, straw and weeds. Basically you want brown material, green material, brown material, green material. Okay. Now that's when you do it professionally. If you don't do it professionally, because you don't have time, like me, <laughs> you just chuck everything on a pile, <laughs> give water, pray, and hope for the best. And it works. it works. Yes, you have to dig, and it's a little bit work, more work. You take the, the undecayed stuff off, take the decayed stuff out the bottom, turn it around. So when I need it, I dig it out at the bottom. And then uh, you carry on like that. Here's, so here are little mechanisms you can do and you can become very fancy. You can make uh, little containers with hay bales and leave little gaps for air to come through and then you throw all this material in there. Then the bale actually becomes part of the compost. compost yeah. So when it rots away, it becomes part of the next one. Anything that can decay goes in there. So start with a couple of layers if you want to do it professionally. If you don't have time, uh, I used to do it this way. Just put the hay bales round, put the compost in the middle. And then by the end of the season, half of it has become compost. And turn the bale round, take the outside off, add it to the compost, do it for another season. It actually is quite fun. Then you can use raised beds. Mm -hmm. The older you become, 
the better the raised bed is because you don't have to bend down the whole time to it. Yes, gravity <laughs> is the enemy of anybody <laughs> who gets on in years. So a raised bed is very nice. You can use anything to make a raised bed. Here they've used concrete blocks. You can stack two or three on top of each other. You can just play regular plant debris, mm. even branches in the bottom, and just have the top little layer filled with soil and then a rich layer of compost. And uh, if your soil has these added things like rock phosphate or calcitic lime in it, then you have all the minerals. And these bacteria are so happy with the compost that they start making the most marvelous, marvelous products. Another thing that you want to consider is using heirloom seed. Heirloom seed is seed that has not been manipulated. And you get many stores that provide heirloom seed. You can just look it up in the internet. You can uh, order them yeah, they via can, courier. It's, that's it. it's the easiest way to get around them. Around the world they can and people are becoming a little bit wiser. I see even our stores have heirloom seeds yes. now. I nearly fell on my back the other day. Uh, the nice thing about heirloom seeds is um, their flavor. They might not bear as many as the others, but their quality is just amazing. A beefsteak tomato, for example, is a marvelous thing. So you can grow any of these wonderful products in, uh, in the open air or in a little greenhouse if, you, if you're living in a cold area. And organic tomatoes, tomatoes, as some would say, are just amazing. This is my boss, and she is here with our parrot. This is a number of years ago, and these were some of the tomatoes from our little garden. And uh, we had a net around it, and a shade cloth net, and then we grew the tomatoes in this fashion. Now. Just a little tip, if you grow a tomato, it grows up, right? And it makes many side branches. If you nip carefully, read up about it, nip out the side branches and only keep the main one going up, then you will get tomatoes at the bottom and then the next crop and the next crop and the next crop. Try to clear the bottom leaves so that the bottom doesn't get wet feet. Then it doesn't get mold so easily, it doesn't rot so easily, and it makes a beautiful plant. Another thing to remember with a tomato plant is that you want a very good rootstock. Mm. Now, when you make a seedling and it grows up and the roots are like this and you plant it again as, f as far as the roots are, you will get a nice plant, mm. but it won't be a very strong plant. What you do so when you have the plant about this high, yes. let's say about 10 centimeters high, you pluck off the bottom little tiny leaves and then you plant it deeper than the root system. It'll make roots all along that area and give you a much stronger plant. Yeah. And don't be afraid to take off the bottom plants mm. and then... Those uh, fine little hairs. They make roots. The roots, yes. Yes, they make roots. So we keep the bottom clean, like this, and then we grow them up. And then you start harvesting the bottom, right? And eventually it'll go through the roof if yeah. it can. So another little thing that you can do is you can tie it up up there and then you can loosen it and lay it on the ground and let it go up again. And then you can get so from many... From one plant. From one plant you can feed so many people. It's an amazing thing to do. It's fun. But as I said in the beginning, you can do microculture in your house, and then you have good greens to eat and augment uh, what you have together with simple foods like potatoes, etc. And this is what our tomato crop looked like. And uh, that's a nice beefsteak tomato. One slice of that on a, on a piece of bread with avocado and, and you are living better than a king. Yeah. <laughs> 
these were some of our cucumbers. You could kill someone with them if you hit them <laughs> over the head with it. So it's really fun to do, and, and the rewards are amazing. I, I must agree that the taste, you cannot compare it with no. anything. Because no. when the first time I tasted the, your own grown uh, organic, organic if, you take, if you take a lettuce out of an organic garden, and you take a lettuce out of a store, the one tastes like water yes. with a crisp crispiness to it, and the other one... <laughs> you have to actually almost get used to the yeah, taste. Yeah, because it's got all it's the minerals this, in it. Yeah. Wow, what's this? Uh, some people will say there's something wrong with it. Yeah. But once you've gotten used to it, uh, you can't, eat you can't go else. back to the other, right? It's like the your bread recipe. Yes. Um, when before we made the bread like our own bread, we used to buy store bread. Yo, now for three years now we've been only baking our own bread. If I get a store bread now, it's unedible almost. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's fun. Now, you know, some people ask, uh, well, how do you deal with all the pests? Because, you know, non-organic farming, mm -hmm. because the plants have no resilience, because they're feeding the plants with the minimum number of minerals that they need. They look fine, but uh, they don't have what it takes. Even their immune system is very weak. Mm -hmm. So uh, organic farming is more, the plant is more resilient. Now, how do you deal with pests, for example? We make use of very simple uh, pesticides. You will get pests. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, the weaker plants are more susceptible than stronger plants. So if you have, for example, a broccoli patch, and one of them is full of plant lice, then rather than stressing yourself into a coma, Take that one out and don't put it into your compost. Don't use it again. Throw it away. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. And the other should be relatively un uninfected. But if you do get white lice or white fly or any one of these things, which can happen is particularly if it's warm and mm, moist, moist and you'll get fungus and Tomatoes are very susceptible. Yes. You can keep the bottom um, free of leaves, that helps. Mm -hmm. But you can make very, very simple pesticides, which also are natural fungicides. And one of the best ones to use is neem oil. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, little, there's a little recipe that you can use to make a spray with neem oil. And basically, it's two parts neem oil and one part natural liquid soap. Okay. Now you cannot use commercial liquid soap like dishwashing liquid, which is a liquid soap. Mm. But it has so many other stuff in it it's that, it, that is not good. So you need natural liquid soap. So if you can buy from a health food store natural liquid soap that is natural soap with no garbage in it, fine, then use that. Then you use two parts neem oil, one part liquid soap. If you cannot buy the liquid soap, make your own. Get a bar of natural soap. Homemade soap, not chemically induced soap with all of these artificial sulfates and stuff that make it foam, natural soap. We've got a whole, your wife did a whole le um, lecture on making, on soap. making soap, so yes. I'll put the link of that also. Ah, I'll put a link on that, one. but if you don't buy, make your own soap, that's yeah. fine, go and buy a bar of soap. Uh, use a very simple soap, you can use uh, simple soaps that they use for washing, for example. And then you grate uh, one cup to three, th one cup and add three cups boiling water. And then you dissolve that. You can also put it on the stove and dissolve it all. And that's a liquid soap. You can keep that in a bottle. That's your liquid soap. And then you have your neem oil. And now if you want to make a pesticide out of it, you take 
two parts neem oil and one part liquid soap. So you can take, let's say, two tablespoons of neem oil yes. one and one tablespoon of your liquid soap and you mix those two together. Then you take of that three teaspoons of this mixture. It must be nice and homogenized. The oil must be all homogenized with the soap. It will become sort of whitish. Then you take in uh, American language, one gallon of water, mm -hmm. four and a half liters. liters of water, and you add three teaspoons full of this mixture. And that's your spray. It will prevent fungus, but if you have serious fungus, then you have to get rid of the fungus with a copper spray. But if you regularly spray with this neem oil spray then you will keep the pests away and you will also keep fungus away. So it's a beautiful thing it's nice to use. Way. Anyway, so that's what some of our stuff looked like. Uh, I'm sure you can get them bigger. We had one cucumber which was one meter tall. It was, was a, a, an heirloom seed, Japanese long. What an amazing cucumber. <laughs> a little bit prickly but beautiful in taste. It was about this thick and one meter long. So <laughs> it's like a tent post. <laughs> anyway, these are some of the things you can be doing and some of the projects, produce we produced and uh, we dried basil leaves. And this is what organic farming will do. You will get amazing results. You can get huge leaks, huge. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, if you grow leeks, for example, don't just uh, rip them out, mm -mm. You cut them off. And it grows back. And leave that root stump in the ground, it'll grow back. Yes. And lettuce will do the same, won't be as great as the first mm -hmm. time, but leeks work pretty well. Uh, they should work well and you can grow great pumpkins and this is the kind of produce that uh, you want, but you want it organic mm -hmm. and you want it in your home. So, bottom line, if you can secure yourselves a piece of land in the country to get out of the cities with a little piece of land and start playing around with organic farming and to keep yourself going while you wait for your first crop, then you will have problems, things yeah. will go wrong, but that's part of life, it's part of the fun. Just start all over again. Uh, and you will have a mole, and you will have a cutworm, and you will have a this, and you will have a, a that. Grasshopper. And you will have a grasshopper. <laughs> but uh, God is good. Yes. You will still get what you need. Then start doing that. And to keep yourself going, as I said, start with the microgreens, and start with sprouting in your house. And God will bless yes. as you invest in that kind of activity. Thank you, Walter. I think we've covered quite a few different subjects and questions. I'll close with a word of prayer. Absolutely. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together and having a discussion. And also thank you for giving us such wonderful food that we can carry on and live the way you want us to live. Help us in these times that we can discern what we should do and when we should do it and bring us back together and bless everybody that watched this. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.